have a really good program today. And the first session, plenary 13, dimensions, wave functions, and symmetry in the brain. The first speaker is Zuri Wong from uh, University of Michigan from George Mashur's group. And they always do excellent work. And I'm very excited to hear his talk on mapping the brain's functional geometry and its role in consciousness. Come on up, Zuri. Thanks for the nice, uh, nice introduction, George. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you are having a, a wonderful time at the conference so far. Uh, I would like to uh, first express my sincere gratitude uh, to the conference organizers, uh, Stu uh, Stuart and uh, Abby, um, for their gracious uh, invitation. Today, it is my uh, great pleasure to be here and uh, uh, share my research journey on the brain and the consciousness. And the title of my talk is Mapping the Brain's Functional Geometry and Its Role in Consciousness. How do you like this picture? Oh, it's okay, yeah? Uh, I asked ChatGPT to generate it for me. It looks on track, right? But there seems something is missing. Then I asked ChatGPT to add uh, cactus and microtubules on it. <laughs> Bingo. Here it is. Now it's the fla uh, flavor of this conference. Stuart, I hope this is not the only slice relevant to you from my talk. <laughs> All right, back to science. Uh, consciousness is a multifaceted uh, phenomenon which has been uh, the subject of exploration from various perspectives. And understanding the neurobiological foundations of consciousness carries significant implications for, uh, for multiple medical disciplines, including neurology, psychiatry, and anesthesiology. Over the past 30 years, the field has experienced substantial progress driven by numerous uh, empirical and theoretical works that have uh, propelled our comprehension forward. How I approach consciousness? I study brain activity in space and across time. Well, if you think space-time is doomed, that's totally fine, which might be the case. I would like to see in the future the researchers start to understand brain activity without the concept of a space or time. However, in my field, we are not quite ready to get rid of this uh, space and time concept. Sorry. Anyways, uh, for more than a decade, I have delved into the scientific, uh, scientific question regarding the, uh, the connection between the uh, spatial temporal architecture of brain activity and consciousness. My approach to um, studying the brain involved the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging. Through this method, we obtain blood oxygen level dependent signals that reflect neural activity. And these signals are collected from tens of thousands of voxels across the entire brain. Then, how do we analyze the data? One conventional method is to compute correlations among these signals, a technique referred to as functional connectivity. And functional connectivity measures the degree to which a pair of uh, brain regions that are uh, temporally coordinated. And the functional connectivity relationship between brain regions can be represented by a functional connectivity matrix. We can then create uh, network partitions, and this approach help us uh, identify brain regions within a given brain network that are highly connected, potentially serving uh, specific functions like visual processing, somatomotor uh, functions, or, uh, or uh, attention-related processes. Well, the neuroscientific examination of um, and functional connectivity have provided uh, valuable insights into the mechanisms of consciousness. But today, I would like to offer a, a fresh perspective on the data with the hope of uh, shedding new light uh, on the relationship between the brain and 
consciousness. <coughs> How can we gain a deeper understanding of these networks? Recent advancements uh, in neural imaging have introduced a novel approach that uh, reveals overarching principles, shifting the view from the brain's functional networks to functional geometry. So in my following presentation, I will elaborate on the uh, concepts of functional geometry and uh, discuss their roles in consciousness. First of all, let's think of the basic concept of geometry. Geometry deals with the size, shape, and positions of figures in, the sp in space. And the word geometry comes from the Greek words earth and measure. That's fitting because geometry deals with the properties and the relationships of the shapes around us. Also, geometry allows people to measure, analyze, and compare figures in 2D and 3D space. Regarding the brain, there are at least two forms of geometry, anatomical geometry and functional geometry. Anatomical geometry concerns the properties and the relationships of the brain's anatomical shapes in real-world 3D space. In contrast, functional geometry deals with the properties and the relationships of the brain functions in a multidimensional virtual space. A good example of this approach is measuring cortical gradients. Cortical gradients encompass various functions and functional networks on a continuums, uh, continuous spectrum. They span from a unimodal system, these blue areas responsible for perception and action, uh, to transmodal or association cortices, these red areas associated with uh, abstract cognitive functions. To clarify this concept, consider analogy with geographical land. One way to define a region is by using precise Cartesian coordinate that establish a distinct boundary. Alternatively, you can describe uh, the region by considering several topographical axes, such as the slope of the elevation or the spatial variation in vegetation, uh, uh, vegetation types. So in essence, the assessment of topographical continuums uh, forms the basis of cortical gradient mapping. Here's an overview of my talk. Imagine your, uh, your brain has its own internal map, uh, kind of like a GPS of your thoughts and experiences. Today, I'm taking you on a journey to explore two important areas of this map, the cerebral cortex, the wrinkled outer layer of your brain, and the thalamus, a deeper structure that acts like a central hub for processing almost all sensory information and model signals before they reach the cortex. First, we will learn how to measure cortical gradients and how these gradients are linked to consciousness itself. Next, imagine we have a, a, a special uh, compass um, based on how the cortex is organized. We will use it to navigate the thalamus, creating landmarks to understand how it processes different kinds of information. Then things get interesting. What happens to the brain map when we use anesthetics? We will see how these medications change the brain's geometry, potentially affecting uh, consciousness. And finally, we will go deeper, look at specific cells and the chemicals in the thalamus, and our goal is to find, find out if they hold the key to why the brain's functional landscape changes under anesthesia. So how to measure cortical gradients? So without diving into uh, technical details, uh, the process involves breaking down the functional connectomes into a series of embedding gradients. And these gradients serve as descriptors of the spatial axis along which functional connectivity uh, fluctuates across the cortex. Having these gradients project uh, onto the uh, multidimensional space, we could, for, in uh, for instance, measure uh, the numerical range of uh, gradients why we are intrigued by the cortical gradients. Cortical gradients are complex and multidimensional phenomena that provide insights into the neurofunctional uh, dimensions of the brain. 
Concurrently, consciousness itself is a multidimensional phenomenon, which may be linked to the brain's neural function. We were motivated to elucidate their connection by constructing a brain-based framework uh, for understanding consciousness as a multidimensional concept. Why do we describe consciousness as a multidimensional phenomenon? Well, consciousness can be influenced by a multitude of factors. Conventionally, consciousness has been uh, uh, defined based on two separate components, awareness uh, and wakefulness or vigilance. For instance, in individuals diagnosed with a uh, wedded state, formerly known as unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, uh, may display eye-opening and sleep awake cycles, it's generally believed that the lack of uh, uh, awareness for both themselves and their environment. Consequently, their condition is classified as wakefulness without awareness. However, this conventional defin definition somewhat assumes that the normal consciousness is linked to the highest levels of awareness and wakefulness. This viewpoint raises questions when we apply to outer state of consciousness, such as those induced by uh, psychedelics, uh, psychedelic substance, or psychiatric conditions like schizophrenia. In these cases, individuals can dis display full awareness and sometimes even richer conscious experience as compared to their uh, ordinary conscious state. In recent years, a theoretical framework has emerged proposing that the concept of multidimensional uh, representa uh, representa representations of consciousness. Nevertheless, an important knowledge gap has been the identification of what these dimensions really are in neural terms. We examined cortical gradients in large cohorts of healthy, awake, and anesthetized participants, as well as patients with uh, neuropathological and a psychiatric diagnosis. And these states of consciousness have both common and unique characteristics with respect to awareness, sensory organization, and arousability. For example, propofol deep sedation suppresses awareness with preserved arousability to pain stimulation. Propofol general anesthesia induces loss of awareness and uh, loss of arousability. Ketamine anesthesia is associated with sensory disorganization and partially preserved internal awareness and arousability. Unresponsive weakness syndrome is associated with disrupted awareness with preserved arousability and sensory organization. Schizophrenia is associated with sensory disorganization. We found that a shift in the conscious state is associated with a change along, uh, along one or more of these neurofunctional dimensions as indicated by the degradation of cortical gradients. For example, gradient one, unimodal to transmodal, uh, was degraded in deep sedation and the general anesthesia with propofol and in patients with unresponsive weakness syndrome, indicating loss of awareness. Gradient two, visual to somato sensory, uh, was degraded in uh, ketamine anesthesia and uh, schizophrenia, su suggesting sensory disorganization. And gradient three, task negative to task positive uh, gradient. That is the brain regions showing activation or deactivation during cognitive tasks, degraded when subjects were no longer arousable by, pa by pain stimulation during high dose general anesthesia. So in sum, we present evidence that cortical gradients of unimodal to transmodal, visual to somatomodal, and task negative, task positive uh, gradients represent three neurofunctional dimensions of consciousness, that is awareness, sensory organization, and cortical arousability. To this end, I have discussed how the functional geometry is associated with dimensions of consciousness. The unimodal to transmodal gradient is of particular interest because it shows a major degradation when awareness is suppressed by propofol anesthetics. And considering that thalamocortical circuits has, have long been recognized as crucial pathways for conscious processing, we asked the question of whether cortical, uh, cortical functional axes correspond to the uh, 
thalamocortical circuits. We craft, uh, crafted a method to pinpoint uh, the unimodal transmodal functional geometry of the thalamocortical circuits, aligning it with the unimodal transmodal functional, functional axis of the cortex. In this way, the thalamic regions show distinct preference in their connection to the cortex. So here, the red-orange thalamic areas indicate a stronger functional connect, connect, uh, connection with transmodal cortical regions than with the uh, unimodal cortical areas uh, suggesting uh, a transmodal dominant pattern. And conversely, the blue areas display a dominance towards uh, unimodal connections. We test this method in various data sets when uh, participants were uh, fully conscious, and the maps are quite consistent. And these data sets include more than 1,000 participants from Human, human Connectome Project, uh, UCLA Healthy Group, and our study group. What happens to this map when we uh, use anesthetics? We studied conscious baseline, deep sedation, and the recovery conditions. Deep sedation was achieved by incrementally increasing the dose of uh, anesthetic propofol until loss of behavior responsiveness. We found that thalamic unimodal transmodal functional geometry was, uh, was present during the conscious and the recovery conditions, whereas uh, transmodal deficient, or in other words, uh, unimodal dominant geometry was present across the entire thalamus during deep sedation. To further illustrate the geometric changes of uh, thalamocortical circuits, we extract the gradient values from predefined thalamic areas. As you can see, during conscious conditions, uh, thalamic areas showed, showed a progression from transmodal dominant to unimodal dominant areas, broadly from anterior to posterior uh, areas. During deep sedation, however, all thalamic areas were unimodal dominant. So, the results indicate a geometric transformation in thalamocortical functional connectivity during deep sedation. That is, a shift from unimodal transmodal geometry to a transmodal deficient one. We next asked whether certain thalamic cell types that may account for a change in uh, functional geometry during anesthesia. The thalamus has a heterogeneous uh, cytoarchitecture with at least two distinct cell classes known as co- and matrix cells. They send differential projections to the cortex. Cortex uh, uh, core cells um, primarily uh, innervate the granular layers of the co uh, cerebral cortex, and matrix cells innervate uh, the supergranular cortex in a relatively diffuse manner. Here, the cell types were inferred uh, from the mRNA expression levels from uh, two Gaussian um, binding proteins, uh, CALB1 corresponding to matrix cells, and PVALB corresponding to co cells, provided by the island, brain, uh, island human brain atlas. And the ratio of CALB1 and the PVALB levels is called uh, CPT metric, with positive values in red indicate areas that are matrix uh, cell rich, and the negative values in blue indicate areas that are uh, co-cell rich. We then correlate the CPT values with group average thalamic gradient values across all uh, thalamic voxels. Indeed, we observed a positive correlation between the unimodal transmodal functional axis of the thalamocortical circuits and the co-matrix cell uh, architecture which is quite exciting. Well, what does this correlation mean? It means that matrix rich thalamic areas have stronger functional connectivity with transmodal cortical areas, whereas co-rich thalamic areas have stronger functional connectivity with unimodal cortical areas. Next, we sought to determine the relative importance of co versus matrix cells in explaining the change of thalamic gradient values from conscious to unconscious states. We performed linear regression and a dominance analysis. We found that 
the percentage of relative importance of metric cells is about 84%, much la larger than that of co-cells. The results suggest that loss of consciousness during deep sedation is primarily associated with the functional disruption of metric cells distributed across the thalamus. Okay, then how about neurotransmitter? We utilized additional uh, covariates derived from 19 uh, receptors and the transporters across nine different transmitter systems. This is open resource PET data shared by Hassan and uh, her colleagues. Again, we find that the mRNA expression level of CALB1 corresponding to metric cells ranked as the top contributor in terms of a percentage relative importance uh, compared to neurotransmitter receptors and transporters. We do see uh, acetylcholine and serotonin receptors account for a certain amount of variance, which warrants future, uh, future investigations. So in summary, unconsciousness was associated with specific alterations in you know, functional, uh, functional hierarchy within thalamocortical circuits. There was a shift from a balanced unimodal transmodal geometry during consciousness to a deficit of uh, transmodal geometry during unconsciousness. And this shift in functional geometry was selectively associated with spatial variations in the density of metric cells within the thalamus. In other words, thalamic regions with high density of metric cells showed a pronounced reduction in transmodal thalamocortical functional connectivity during unconsciousness. So together, we suggest that loss of consciousness may be tied to the preferential, uh, pre uh, prefer uh, prefer uh, preferred disruption of uh, matrix cell connectivity. All right, I hope my uh, presentation resonates uh, with you and uh, sparks some inspiration. And finally, I would like to thank my lovely colleagues who are, uh, who are um, involved in these uh, studies, including Professor Mashur and Professor Hudas. Uh, they are my great mentors. Uh, I also appreciate the generous funding support from the NIH, and thank you all for your attention. I, yep. I welcome uh, any thoughts and questions you might have. I love the way in which you started off from grand principles of mapping and slowly folded down what we can measure to how we can map it and stretch it and finally reduce it to a handful of mathematically coordinates. That's the best way of doing anything. But even more than that, I love that you mentioned thalamus. I haven't heard thalamus mentioned much, and I got familiar with it almost 30 years ago at NIH because there's one particular view which never got published which I'm hoping is consistent with yours. So you've done a large-scale functional mapping, whereas the research I did with it to the high bandwidth level, and it's very simple there. In that land, Cortex is trying to make a model of the world and is trying to rain down predictions, pixel by pixel, as it were, or muscle by muscle, to figure out what's going on. Sensory input is coming up from here and hitting thalamus, the relay cells in particular, and in this weird high bandwidth arrangement, it's spike by spike prediction. So to Cortex, hits the prediction right, it inhibits, nothing happens. If it fails at the prediction, the spike goes through and goes on up. And if it hits a prediction which doesn't take place, there's a slow dead silence and then a post-inhibitory rebound burst, which is different from a single spike and signals the opposite sign. So it's a non-rectifying comparator. I know it's weird, but if that sounds like it's any kind of sense to you, I'd like to talk to you about it later. Thank you, that's very interesting. It's, I like the interpretation and uh, description about the uh, dynamic cortical relationship. And also a resonance uh, um, of you researchers uh, that showed, uh, shared a view that uh, cortex doing computations and uh, uh, subcortical including thalamus uh, to, uh, uh, associated with experience. And uh, why there are not many um, uh, talks talking about thalamus in this conference, uh, that's my uh, personal conjecture is that most people maybe just measure uh, EEG that's hard to reach the deep uh, subcortical structures. And uh, I mainly study functional MRI so that we have the advantage, uh, advantage of dealing with uh, very precise locations in subcortical regions. So thalamus can be 
uh, studied in our approach, actually. Thank you. Let me, excuse me. One comment uh, before we, we go to Anatoly. Uh, thalamus isn't necessary for consciousness, for example, in the case of smell. So we, we don't exclude it intentionally, but there, but there is that over there. Here is a question. <clears throat> On the internet, you can find information that ki or prana is considered multidimensional energy. Did you consider that, that you try to relate it to your concept? And second, are you familiar, again, on the internet, there is a common idea of density of consciousness. Can you comment on that? Uh, could you repeat you your much. first question, please? I, I, I couldn't hear it clearly, clearly, the first question. Shall I say again? I repeat the question briefly, please. The first question, please. First question. Um, do you relate um, multiple dimensions, nearly functional dimensions, as you define them, to multiple dimensions mentioned online regarding ki or prana? Uh, that's the first question. And second, do you know anything about definition of density of consciousness? Yeah, first talk about your uh, second question. The definition of density of consciousness, uh, I, I'm not uh, here, but uh, haven't heard about that. So okay. uh, I, I don't know um, what, what is it. Okay. And uh, for the first question, you're talking about uh, dimensions of yes. uh, consciousness. How that uh, relate to what? Uh? Dimensions of so-called conscious energy, ki or prana. It's, uh, some people are trying today measure it. But these measurements are difficult, and one of the opinions is because it is more than 3D. Do you know anything about that? Because you talk about multiple dimensions, that's why I'm asking. I see. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think our current approach has the potential to approach uh, more, uh, more dimensions rather than uh, three dimensions. Uh, we can de decompose the connectivity into like more than 10 dimensions. But I haven't really explored that, but I think that's a valid question. Yep. Um, and how do, final, how do you define their functional dimension, definition? That requires uh, substantial investigations in relation to uh, kind of behavior measures, I think. So it is not geometrical that, dimension, that it is function, a functional dimension. It's different from three d those dimensions that are in 3D, right? Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Let me ask you a question and then we'll go to you. Hang on. Have you looked at the uh, uh, <coughs> gradient in terms of uh, frequency? Like earlier in the week, we heard from Earl Miller where if you, sensory processing and the cortex goes from fast to slow as it moves forward, and then going down, uh, it goes fast to slow to get to the in, in the pyramidal. So frequency is that a uh, gradient too? That's a very important remark. Um, we uh, current fMRI, we uh, the temporal resolution at second level, so we cannot reach uh, uh, kind of higher frequencies. But I think uh, in the future, if we combine uh, diff uh, technology together, like a, a concurrent EEG fMRI or MEG. Uh, that we can approach uh, a, a more uh, different, uh, wider range of frequencies. Maybe megahertz. EEG. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, hope. <laughs> uh, hi. So um, another brain structure organ that we uh, that I haven't heard uh, discussed too much in the conference is the corpus callosum. So I was wondering if that factors into any uh, measures of consciousness. Uh, I think that's possible uh, we, because we study um, the, um, uh, the functional MRI signal mainly from the gray matter, so we haven't really touched upon that uh, structures. Yeah. Great. Let's yep. give Zuri a round of applause for a great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the next talk is from Santosh Halakar from uh, Houston Methodist and Wild Cornell Medicine. Experimental evidence for the neurophysical basis of consciousness using a newly developed photoelectronic sentiometer. Say, take it away, Santosh. Thank you. Some of you saw the uh, uh, reenactment of Dave, uh, of, uh, Dave Chalmers at the 1996 uh, uh, conference. Uh, what could he do after the heart problem uh, of 94? So he pulled out, he said he had a consciousness meter and he pulled out a hair dryer that he borrowed from my secretary and pointed at people and had a switch that could make it light up if he saw someone that was conscious. And anyway, this is the real deal though. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Stuart, for inviting me here. Good morning, everybody. And I'd like to congratulate Stuart for this wonderful 30 years uh, and making this foundational contribution to neuroscience for all of us so that we can, uh, consciousness research is a legitimate neuroscientific uh, study uh, approach. So let me see, I think I have 35 minutes. I have a lot of data to show you. Uh, basically, because this is just so wild and weird, what I'm gonna to present to you. <laughs> and I have to basically um, convince you of a lot of experimental, uh, with a lot of experimental evidence that what I'm recording is real. <laughs> and it's not an artifact, and it's not something spooky, <laughs> even though it might sound because of the type of evidence um, uh, that we have collected. In any case, so uh, I have to probably make two disclaimers. One is that I'm not a physicist. I rely, <laughs> for the physics, I rely on Sir Roger Penrose. And for the biology, I, although I am a neuroscientist and medically trained, so I know a little bit about biology. Uh, I'm not a chemist, so I don't know much about microtubules, but I rely on Stuart Hameroff for that. And so what I'm gonna concentrate on is mainly experimental evidence. But I'm gonna tell you about theory just to, as a motivation, for me at least, to develop this device. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I attended the 1996 uh, TSE here, and then one at, uh, in um, Elsinore, uh, Denmark, where I was highly skeptical of Stuart's ideas, and I, I did a lot of questioning, and Stuart probably doesn't remember, <laughs> but, but I'm sort of a, a convert to his and Sir Roger's ideas, and then I'm, I'm going to give you um, the reason for that, uh, but more importantly, I don't actually want to marry to with any particular theory. I, I want to show you the evidence. It supports Sir Rogers and Stewart's ideas, but uh, there could be alternative explanation, as we say in science. And uh, hopefully, some of you who are physicists would come up with those explanations. Uh, but I think. There is good evidence, at least, for the fact that consciousness is a, or whatever that, whatever that I'm detecting ha has quantum basis. Okay, so let's start. Doesn't work? Okay, anyway. All right, so the first uh, sort of motivation, th this idea, I I've been bitten by the consciousness bug in medical school, probably much earlier than that. Uh, but one of the things that have always struck me, which, which people, psychologists have talked about, but people haven't paid too much attention to, which is that uh, our consciousness is a stream. It's a serial process, okay, and it's best uh, articulated by this quote from William James in, in an article titled The Stream of Consciousness. The simp simplest thing, therefore, if we are to assume the existence of a stream of consciousness at all, would be to suppose that things that are known together are known in single pulses of that stream. So it is one damn thing after another that we uh, usually experience, right? So. That's how our consciousness is. Everybody experiences it. So the, each conscious moment has limited information holding capacity as it transitions sequentially from one moment to the next. This, is, uh, this has a lot of psychological exper uh, experimental evidence. So the thing, the leap that I made from this is that therefore one can model the underlying brain activity that codes for conscious experiences as a time series of unfolding activity patterns. So you can now apply mathematics and, and physics to this and record. So I'm, I'm, we are uh, in, in neurophysiology, which is where I come from, we are used to time series, <laughs> right? So EEG is a time series uh, from multiple channels. And 
all of the recordings we do intracellularly from neurons are time series. So you can grasp, I, I, I can understand a time series. So that's how I looked at it. Okay, so what's the next thing? The next thing which I was first introduced to through Emperor's New Mind by Roger Penrose in 1989 and really caught on to the idea of his uh, using Gödel's theorem to come up with a, uh, a quantum hypothesis. And everybody is familiar with this, so I won't belabor on this point, but basically uh, there's something inside the brain, probably electrons, that get converted from waves to particles, or wave, uh, what he calls objective reduction, and it's orchestrated in the brain, obviously. So arc OR. And basically, for me, it was conversion of waves into particles inside the brain. And the thing that has developed now through Stuart's effort is that it's in the microtubules, but not just in the microtubules. It's in the, the benzene con containing amino acids that are periodically, um, they, that might follow Fibonacci series, for instance, and a period, uh, they have a periodic structure, especially tryptophan. So those are, keep those in mind, although, as I said, I don't make strong claims about the theory. A theory is just a tool for me to develop the device, so it's, it's more from that standpoint that I focus on this. Then, of course, there are, as you all know, there are many psychoactive neurotransmitters in the brain, three principal ones being serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. They have the ring structures, benzene rings and an indole ring, and all of the psychedelics that we know have the indole uh, ring through serotonin type uh, derivative of the indole ring. And the thing about um, the benzene ring that Stuart talks about, which would be important in the last part of my talk, is that they have these delocalized electrons that go, go round and round above and below the benzene rings and that's where the action happens. In other words, that's where waves are converted into particles. That's the idea, right? So, but, but you, you have to recognize that these structures are present in many other things, including DNA, as somebody had talked about before, and, and many other proteins. But, but the, probably the critical thing is the structure, the, the periodicity of the locations of these uh, benzene rings. Okay, so, okay, this is the quantum leap, no, no pun <laughs> intended here, that I made from my non-physics background, sort of, is that if, the, if this collapse phenomenon is confined to the brain, it's hard to measure it, right? But what if this collapse phenomenon influences, uh, uh, kind of has a spreading influence in space? So the collapse of an electron, say, collapses the surrounding electrons or any other waveforms in the surrounding vicinity of, the, of this collapse uh, event that occurred. And it spreads through the whole brain, spreads outside the brain to some extent, and maybe spreads through the whole body as well. And so if that's the case, it spreads out in space. So I can bring a little device of mine which can detect conversion of waves into particles just outside my brain, by my head, and see if I can make the waves in that device collapse, right, when, when I bring it close to the head. Because if the collapses must be occurring all the time, if they are right in the brain. So, so that's, so what I, okay, so this is the mechanism or a extended quantum biological hypothesis that I came up with just out of the blue. And I don't want to, again, hold this, uh, I don't want to make this as a strong claim that I'm making. It's mostly a tool for me to develop the device. So the mechanism of consciousness according to this involves modulating, modulated spontaneous conversions of waves into particles or collapse slash decoherence. I'm, I'm kind of hedging the bats and, and you know, using both collapse and decoherence from physics standpoint because I don't know which is right, of the wave function of electrons, protons, and ions in the brain, which are there. Uh, there is a special type of biomolecular apparatus that has evolved in living organisms to bring into existence and, ampl uh, and amplify this mechanism. 
its influence spreads, decreasing with distance in the entire brain and the body, and even extends into space surrounding the head and the body, where it can be measured by an instrument. Right? So it's, it's kind of self-serving for me be, for, to develop the device. Its influence re, uh, replicates this, the same pattern of conversion or collapse of any wave function in that space, as, as you see inside the brain. Okay, so I hope this thing, does this work? I don't know how it doesn't work. Anyway. Okay, so the simplest device where you can measure conversion of waves into particles is the double slit apparatus, which everybody is familiar from high school physics, where <clears throat> if, if, if a light beam is a wave, then you see an interference pattern. If you somehow know which uh, which slit the light goes through, or photons go through, they collapse into two bands, and the interference pattern di disappears. So that sort of gave me the idea, and uh, so what I did was miniaturize this whole device into a little box, okay, like that, um, and the box basically has a double slit, the first version of this, by the way, has a double slit, has a laser, which shine, uh, the laser shines light waves through the double slit and then produces an interference pattern. I can sample the bands, the bright bands in the interference pattern by having light sensors in an array form and then recording the current coming out of each of these light arrays. So if uh, there is collapse and the photon, uh, light waves become photons, then there should be a tendency for decreased intensity of the interference bands. Okay, it's pretty simple. And so then we, of course, generalize this thing. You don't need a double slit apparatus for looking at this. Diffraction is also a wave phenomenon. So you can have a, uh, another device which instead of having the double slit, you just have a li uh, laser light shi shine onto this, you know, a spot on the screen and have uh, photosensitive sensors around in the periphery of that dot where there's diffraction. And so if light is a wave, and if waves get converted to particles uh, in that kind of a situation, the, the fringe or the penumbra of the spot should decrease, the intensity there should decrease. And so both of those kinds of uh, devices would be able to detect uh, if there is a collapse and its influence spreads outside, outside the brain and the head. And so that's what we did, we made, so we call it, we call this thing the sentiometer because we think it measures sentience or the mechanism underlying sentience. Uh, so it looks like this and I have it here with me and I've recorded from several people at this conference. It's a pretty simple device. This is the sensor, this, there is a processor or a microcontroller which basically samples, has an A to D converter in it, takes, takes the light waves, I mean, uh, you know, that are converted into currents or voltages and uh, amplifies them. And then you can record using a simple computer, laptop computer or, or a tablet or an I, iPad. Okay, so it's a very simple device. Uh, okay, so what do you, Get. So if you take this thing and put it in an empty lab room, or any, any empty room, you get pretty much straight lines, okay, in all four lab, uh, channels. You get uh, pre pretty much stay straight with some noise in the, ba uh, in the baseline. So what I do then is I want to see if there is, what is common, what the, the variance that occurs in these four lines for, from four photosensors what is common across those four, four lines? And that's what I want to know. And so to do that, I do what is called principal component analysis, and then I take the first principal component score and plot it, but normalize it so that uh, you will see what I do in the next slide. Um, so, so that whatever is, whenever there is a decrease in the intensity, it will be projected as an increase. Uh, sort of like, since I'm a neuroelectrophysiologist, it is sort of excitatory postsynaptic potentials being recorded from a whole human rather than a neuron, okay? So you'll know what I mean here. So if you take this sensor and then bring it close to your head like this, 
you, the intensity decreases in all the four channels. And then if I take a principal component of it and then transform, do this normalization, I convert it into a nice EPSP type uh, response, a transient response for just a 10 minute exposure to the head. Okay, so I'm going to go. So we did a double blind experiment because in, in medicine, double blind clinical trials, always a double blind uh, experiment is recommended. And so in other words, you had uh, two chairs in a room uh, where one chair had an active uh, centiometer sensor unit, the other chair had an inactive one. And then we let the subject go into the room and play musical chairs, right? Shift from one to the other. The, the experimenter who was outside uh, sitting there uh, instructing the subject didn't know which chair he was shit, uh, sitting in. And so, and then of course after the experiment, we unblinded the results and found that every time he's, he sat near the active uh, centiometer, we got a nice response. When he was on the inactive centiometer, he, he didn't get a response. So that convinced us, and we've done this like many, many times now. Okay, so remember I said that the, this response should fall off with distance with my little hypothesis, speculative hypothesis. And that is indeed what we see. With increasing distance from the head, uh, you see a fall off of the amplitude of the with distance. And roughly, it, although it's not exactly, but roughly it, is an in, it falls off with an inverse square relationship, just like an electromagnetic field or a gravitational field. Okay, remember I told you that it, the response should spread through the whole body by the same mechanism, right? And there are lots of wave functions milling around inside the body, so you should ha get that same thing with any part of the body. And we've done this with different parts of the body. Here I show you the same kind of relationship with the hand. <clears throat> okay, so you, mo I mean, everybody who is skeptical when they see this thing, including us, obviously, even though it's our recordings. So the simplest thing would be body heat causing it. So somehow temperature, there's a thermal effect on the laser or something. And so I will show you data that says this is not. Uh, so basically, it cannot be accounted for by body heat. It cannot be accounted for by biophotons, this new thing that people are measuring. Uh, it cannot be accounted for by respiration or, uh, or sounds or humidity or waves of air pressure because the response is undiminished in vacuum, and I'll show you in a vacuum chamber. Um, radio frequency waves don't seem to affect it. Uh, uh, definitely radio frequency waves coming out of the head is not responsible for it. We have done it with different kinds of Faraday uh, enclosures, bags, boxes, uh, large Faraday rooms, uh, cages. Uh, none of those things seem to uh, matter. Uh, it can, it's not due to a magnetic field because uh, you cannot block it with a magnetic shield. You, even if you bring very strong magnet close to the, to the sensor, you cannot produce anything, no response at all. It cannot be, it's not due to electric, electric field coming out. So we took a plasma lamp or a plasma globe which produced a very high voltage oscillating or alternating electric field close to the, to the sensor and you just get noise in the baseline. You don't get this nice transient response. Okay, so I'm gonna show you quickly the, those things. So basically to mimic uh, 37 degrees uh, Celsius, having an influence on the sensor and causing the response, we just heated the water, uh, water bath to 37 degrees. It produces the same kind of temperature change at the sensor. It's 1.6 uh, degrees Celsius, but it produces a much smaller response, less than one third of the response you get with the hand. Okay, so the, most of the two-thirds of the response is not due to a body heat. Um, the, we increase the temperature, um, you know, slowly uh, by heating the water bath at different temperatures, and then cooling the, the water bath by dropping uh, um, cubes of ice in the bath, and, and, and looked at how the response tracks with the change in temperature. And, so by the way, I call, I've given this artificial name to the, to the scale, and I call them centions. Basically, it's a cention scale. 
Uh, if you come up with a better name, just let me know. <laughs> I can include that. So there is 16 centions per degree change, degree Celsius change, when we increase the temperature, and 13 centions per degree change uh, when we decrease the temperature. Okay, so I also, be, I mean, we really went crazy with this because, I mean, this is the most important sort of caveat in the whole thing. So if you norm equalize the temperature uh, of the sensor to 37 degrees with the water bath and then bring your head close to it, you still see a, a large enough response, almost the same response that you otherwise see. So again, this also shows that it's not just the temperature increase. Okay, so this is inside a vacuum chamber, right? So the, we put the device in the vacuum chamber and did the experiment again. So this rules out your breathing. It rules out even body heat to some extent, but there's, of course, radiated heat. Um, and it also rules out things like humidity and sound. And, you know, if there's sounds coming out of the head or something, they should be not be propagated inside vacuum. So, in fact, you get a little bit larger response than in air. Okay, so this is in the Faraday enclosure. Again, larger, slightly larger response inside the Faraday enclosure. Okay, so now what does this have to do with the consciousness? That's the question you ask. Even though the whole thing was motivated by consciousness, but anybody would say, is this really? Re so the, I found that there are eight criteria that we can use, and this, this is true for anything, right? If you measure an effect the, you're able to measure some kind of an effect. How would you know it's due to consciousness? The first one is obviously effect should be reversibly blocked or reduced by general anesthesia, right? Second is it should be cyclically modulated during sleep because in sleep you dream and you also go through deep dreamless sleep. So that those are unconscious states alternating with conscious states. Then the uh, the effect should emerge solely from the brain. This is the neuroscientist in me. I mean, there are people who believe it could be the heart or something, right? But, but uh, let's say it's the brain. And so, but I, I need to test it rigorous, rigorously if it's the brain. The fourth is something that was inspired by, mostly by Stuart's uh, promotion of, of this idea, which was the effect should emerge from a physical chemical process, and the specific one that I had in mind was benzene rings, electron clouds, pi electron clouds, uh, delocalized electrons, okay? Even though there are delocalized electrons in methyl groups as well, but the most of them are concentrated in a benzene ring. Then, so the, the colored ones that I've shown here are all pieces of evidence that I'm going to present here now, okay? Uh, I have to go really <laughs> quickly through all that, but I, I'll do that because you, you know the basic phenomenon. And the, uh, the gray uh, elements, which is the effect should be substantially reduced or altered in patients who are unconscious due to brain damage. We are doing a study on this in unconscious patients in the ICU. Effect should be reversibly altered in altered states of consciousness, such as meditation and psychedelic states. We have plans to do those. The effect should be modulated by perceptual and mental activity. We are doing this in the lab right now. I don't have the data to show, although I have some preliminary evidence. Patterns should record it during conscious experiences. Should be a code for their contents. This is the big deal. So if, if this is true, there's lots of applications for this, this device. Okay, so the first criterion, effect should be reversibly blocked or reduced by general anesthesia. So, <clears throat> So we, found, we did this in a mouse. Uh, we couldn't do it in a patient unless, or, or in a uh, yeah, patient, because you need this whole IRB process. We have to convince I, the IRB or ethics committee that this is not something weird, that I'm doing something to the patient or something. So that takes time. So we, did, we started out with mice. And um, so basically, awake state mouse has a nice response. Anesthetized, the amplitude decreases, but something else happens, which is, the, the rise of the response is faster, so the rise time is decreased, okay? Uh, we've done isoflurane, we've done ketamine xylazine, we have done pentobarbital, and we have done propofol. Propofol is kind of tricky in a mouse. You, you have to inject it uh, intraperitoneally, and it kills the mouse most of the time, because it's hard to inject it in, intravenously in a mouse. So, 
Uh, with propofol, though, we saw the same kind of thing, although we lost a lot of mice. I'm sorry about people who are sensitive to this kind of thing. Uh, I apologize. But this was done in a very ethical way, uh, approved by our animal ethics committee. Okay. So the one other thing that we observed, is, especially with injectable, was that the recovery from anesthesia did not involve recovery, complete recovery of the amplitude. Uh, what really recovered faster was the rise time. Um, you know, so that may be something uh, to, to watch out for in, in our human experiments. But <clears throat> anyway, so the simple model that explains this is uh, if, the, if there are these uh, collapsing sites on a, on a necklace, a pearl necklace kind of a situation, which would be a simpler uh, representation of a microtubule chain or a protein chain, um, these collapsing sites would, the number of sites that collapse would decrease uh, in the anesthetized state, and they might be synchronized. So I simulated this thing. So why is this anesthesia effect occurring? It can be explained by a reduced number of collapsing sites. So there, some of them are knocked out by the anesthetic. And also, the remaining that are there are synchronized as opposed to desynchronized. And this is known from EEG. Uh, wakeful EEG is desynchronized. Uh, uh, in sleep state and anesthesia, you get more low, slow wave activity, synchronized activity, large amplitude. Right? Tritinin is uh, two. <clears throat> The effect should be cyclically modulated during sleep. So that is indeed what we see. So if you record during sleep, you see oscillations. And they're roughly, they're off, they're slightly smaller than the sleep cycle, but we haven't actually recorded simultaneously EEG recordings, which we are doing right now. We needed the right kind of device to do that and make people take that home and record and get and be able to access the data. So we're doing that, but this uh, cyclical repetition. So now the one question that always struck us and baffled us was what is the baseline due to? You know, so at baseline, what do we see? Uh, why do we get a, a measurable baseline? And the thing that gave us a hint about that is we did this in, a, in, the, uh, in the lab. We continuously recorded in the lab while people were working. And when they were leaving, the laboratory, we saw a decrease in the baseline. And throughout the night, the baseline was low. And when the researchers came back to work the next day, the baseline went up. So the baseline is dependent on probably the consciousnesses of everybody working in the lab and in surrounding labs. So we are, this, this, we are recording something long distance. And I don't know, maybe it goes, it is non-local, at least at this level, uh, which quantum effects are, and it goes to infinity. But I've heard uh, other calculations that say it's a kilometer or something. Uh, James has, has the calculation. Okay, so the effect should emerge solely from the brain, okay? I'll, so for this again, I again apologize for killing a mouse, euthanizing a mouse. And, but <laughs> what we did is we, so this effect is a long-term effect. It's a slow effect going over tens of minutes. So if, uh, as you can see there, it takes like 30, 25 minutes for it to come and saturate sort of, and then to f go away takes another 30 minutes or so. So we uh, euthanized the mouse, immediately recorded from it. We got a lower amplitude after that. Now, that lower amplitude is because the effect is still decaying. And you can see on the, the graph at 5 to 65 minutes that you see a trend towards going down for the, for the amplitude. And then after that, about two, uh, two hours after that or three hours after that, you get a flat line. So they're dead. The, the, whatever the effect was, the residual effect there was is gone. And of course, we also saw the increase in the, uh, the um, what do you call it, uh, the rise time, uh, rise, uh, uh, decrease in the rise time, okay? So now what we did is the, there is the body and there's the head with the brain. So we decapitated a mouse after it was dead and then recorded from the torso, that's headless uh, body, and then recorded from the head separately. 
what we found with the head is a biphasic response. So there was an initial upswing and followed by a downswing after five to 65 minutes. After two hours, two, three, three hours, we saw an inverted response. So what the heck is an inverted response, right? The, it's a dead brain and you see an inverted response. It uh, wouldn't be conscious, although we don't know, but, but we know that the baseline, there's a baseline, and so this, all this means is that if blaze, baseline is responsible for a, spon uh, a baseline spontaneous collapse rate, uh, this particular brain, after two hours, uh, sh uh, shows a decrease in the collapse rate below the baseline, and that's why you see an inversion. And this is, but it's very critical for the next step. So first thing, of course, we did is took out the brain from a dead mouse, uh, put it in normal saline. Normal saline does not produce a response, but the brain, excised brain from the mouse produces a biphasic response. Uh, excised heart, excised liver don't produce this response. Okay, so it is the brain somehow. Okay, so we recorded from other animals. So mouse, you know, man or human, you know. Uh, we recorded from crayfish. Uh, crayfish shows both uh, kinds of responses, uh, an upward re response and an inverted response. A blue crab shows only inverted response. Cherry stone shows inverted responses. This is like the dead brain. And California blackworm, which are really tiny, shows, uh, and we had to record from a whole clump of them, uh, shows inverted response. Ma trees or plants show inverted response, which are much slower and less amplitude. Okay, the effect should, the criterion four, and this is the last thing, effect should emerge from a physical chemical process, right? And what is our physical chemical process? The benzene rings. So what is a uh, easily available structure, polymeric structure with benzene rings? It's polystyrene, which is plastic. All of the petri dishes are made out of polystyrene. So if I took an empty, uncovered polystyrene petri dish, you don't get a response at all. You put water in it and record from it. There's a little bit of water, you get an inverted response. So there's some interaction of water with the benzene rings. How do I know it's the benzene rings? You, you take polypropylene, which does not have benzene rings. It's a plastic. You get petri dishes made out of it. But it has methyl groups. Methyl groups have these delocalized new, uh, electrons, but there are few of them. You, still, uh, you get a small response compared to polystyrene. Okay, polyethylene, which does not have methyl groups, but just hydrogen atom, uh, uh, atoms. Uh, you, you don't get much of a response. So it has to be the benzene rings that give rise to it. Okay, the last thing, and there's one more, but the, the last thing that really clinches the fact that this is a quantum phenomenon is Okay, so water has hydrogen uh, ions, right, which are protons. So the idea is protons are interacting with, uh, although hydroxyl could also, but we sort of narrowed down to protons. Protons interacting with electrons in the electron clouds, right, produces this effect. So what if you add an, a neutron to the proton? You can do this with heavy water, which is deuterium oxide. Okay, with, you should get less of it. And that's exactly what we find. With heavy water, we get a, less of a response than with water, regular water, okay? The final thing is a head scratcher for me. I have an explanation for this, and I can talk about it in the discussion, but if you cover the Petri dish with the polystyrene lead, lead, you don't see the inverted response. You, in fact, see a small positive response, okay? Why this is? we'll discuss in the discussion, okay? Because it's too wacky, too, too spooky <laughs> for me to tell you about, so. Okay, so the basic idea for me, a working hypothesis, so to speak, is that the mechanism of consciousness involves both electromagnetic patterns of activity which produce your positive response, and also the physical chemical patterns occurring in the molecular lattice, like the like the microtubules, involving protons and ele delocalized electrons. And there's a bidirectional modulation. Why do I think bidirectional modulation? If you don't, if you promise not to tell anyone, because this is so preliminary, I will, I will show you one last slide, okay? So this is it. Magnetic field 
influences the inversion phenomenon. Okay, but this is very, very preliminary. I, I don't hold uh, don't hold me to the veracity of this. Okay, in any case, so uh, my research team, uh, three engineers who work with me who have developed the device, and three uh, bio biologists who work with, uh, who are basically adjacent to our lab, who collaborate with me, uh, Shashank, Arvind, and Omkar, uh, have contributed to this uh, effort, and I thank them for that. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Let's start over there. Thanks for a great talk. A, a question uh, for uh, somebody who's not in the field. Your diagrams of amplitude over time, why do they take that shape? And are they summations? Why do they take that shape over time? Yeah, so uh, basically it's a time series. So there is equilibration going on between the phenomenon, you know, the collapse rate, let's say, if collapse hypothesis is right, the collapse rate influencing collapse inside the little box of mind. Uh, so that takes time. So it is, that's why there's a time constant and it saturates after about 20 minutes and then flattens out. If you record for two hours, you'll get a flat curve above the baseline. And then as you, you come out of there, there's an exponential decay of, the, of that response. That's why you get that shape. Dante. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Santosh. Uh, kind of a follow-on question. When you were doing the uh, anesthesia, why didn't it start out, you had a, when it was awake, you had the baseline at 800 centions. Yeah. I would have expected you would, when the patient is awake, you'd have the baseline at 800, and then the anesthesia would, would cause it to decrease. But your anesthesia was also a baseline at zero, and then you had your time no, response before right, saturation. Sorry. So I, the, I've normalized the data and brought the baseline uh, to zero, zeroed the baseline basically by normalization process. Okay. Okay, so I, I, what you are saying exactly is what happens, and I can plot that data differently. Uh, okay, I think it would be, it would be more com okay. compelling visually to see, yeah. yeah, here's the awake baseline, 800 sentience, and then whatever happens with anesthesia to, to compare yeah. directly to the waking state, to the anesthetic state, right, instead, right, of, right. instead so, of renormalizing. So, yeah, so the baseline is something that gave us, so every time we did a recording, yeah. we got a different baseline, and we attributed it to who was, who's, we cannot ah. prevent from moving, peop, uh, people moving in the hallways around the lab. Right, right. right. So that kind of screws up everything we're doing. We, we put a big sign on the door saying, please don't enter this lab. Right, right, <laughs> you know? at least consciously, so, right, yeah, okay, so, thank you. Yeah, so that is, that is a problem. It's, a, it's an occupational hazard for us. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. All of your work was done in a lab in a building, right? Yes. Can you imagine um, if you had an array of these sensors out in a natural environment? amongst the trees and animals of a wild natural environment that with the proper corroboration and collaboration, you could get a kind of overall uh, environmental sensorial monitoring effect of perhaps even the health of the environment uh, over time. Yeah, so what I did one time is put this thing in the back of my car and drove from Houston to Corpus Christi, which is about 180 miles away. And so we saw, as we moved out into the countryside, we saw a decrease in the baseline. It, I, as we were in the, in the city, we saw a nice increase. And then it, uh, in the countryside, we, we saw a decrease in the baseline. And as we entered Corpus Christi, we saw another increase, which was smaller than in Houston. So yeah, I mean, you can do this in the field, uh, in the countryside, anywhere in the on the mountain. And so the, the effects there, so ideally you should do it in space, and I've maybe talked to Dante about this. <laughs> so put it on an asteroid <laughs> where there's nobody, so I would see almost zero baseline, unless like, these things are going on in these, these molecules. <laughs> now you think. Well, I imagine even a global array eventually yeah. could be like an Earth 
earth scale monitoring it system. It could be an in, the new internet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Hi, so thank you for this wonderful talk. Thank when you were recording sentience during sleep, did you compare dreaming versus dreamless sleep? And were there any difference in the sentience? Can, can you say that again? When you were measuring sentience during sleep, yes. did you compare dreaming versus dreamless sleep? And were there any difference in the data? So we, all we see are these uh, oscillations, right? So presumably, when you see a higher, uh, the peak, the high, you know, that's when they are dreaming. And when it goes down, they are in dreamless sleep. But I have to uh, prove that at least by doing uh, EEG concurrently, which is what I'm doing right now. Okay, Thank you. So, no, no Thank you. So, Stuart has told us how microtubules can make quantum coherence at macroscopic scales, brain size scales. And Anurban has shown us how a microtubule can carry three-dimensional information. My calculations have shown how those microtubules can make a grand mesh, which can simulate reality as precisely as we see it in three dimensions. And now you're showing how the quantum field, which all that is talking about, extends beyond the skull and affects quantum processes which have been established by Feynman and before and are well understood and can be measured. All of those also say that when a lot of humans with these expanded awarenesses are in the same physical place, perhaps even your building, with the researchers coming in and affecting the research, that if you were to get a lot of humans in the same room, the effect might be magnified even further, perhaps even for summing a quantum condensate like bosons. Yeah, so uh, two days ago, and actually for two days, I went to the meditation session and, and had this device on the, the table there recording continuously as people were filing into the room. Okay, and as they were leaving out, you know, and what I saw was when they were filing in, it, the, the response goes up, and there were bumps along the way when they were meditating, which I have to analyze to know because I have the timings of their meditation sessions, and then as they left the room, I saw a decline. So yeah, uh, what you're saying is right. So. Hi. Uh, well, first, I want to commend you on what seems like just a really inspired set of measurements and how broadly you've explored this space in a very scientifically controlled way. So, thanks. Really you. impressive. Um, uh, what, what, uh, my question is um, I wonder if you've considered uh, projecting the diffraction pattern onto a camera because then you can watch the fringes you know, change rather than because I think you've only got sensors in the fringes right now, right? So, have you thought about trying something like that? Yep. I have tried recording, video recording of the interference bands, not, not the diffraction of the, you know, without the double slit. But in the double slit mm -hmm. experiment, I saw, uh, I recorded uh, sort of time lapse, uh, you know, uh, snapshots at different times. Uh, and I do see what you're talking about, basically changes in the light, the, the diffraction pattern, the, the interference. Oh, pattern. very interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. No problem. I wonder if you have tried uh, graphene because you're talking about he you know hexagonal lattice structures with shared electrons, and I'm wondering if graphene would block it or modulate it. And I'm also wondering if you had actually um, you know put the device in benzene or substances with like tons of ar you know aromatic uh, polyaromatic compounds and seeing if that affects it or blocks it or amplifies it. Yeah. Uh, so I tried toluene. <laughs> which is a methyl benzene, right? So the question is whether a, you need a polymer or do you, can you get with just loose benzene molecules? It's preliminary. Uh, you have to do it in a glass pre petri dish or a glass bottle, not in a uh, polystyrene one, okay? Uh, but uh, in a glass petri dish, you see, uh, you don't see much of a response with just toluene molecules floating around. So my hypothesis is, working again, is that you need a polymer uh, of, of these benzenes at particular distances from each other. Closer they are, there's more chance for an interaction going on. You know. Maybe that's good. you need oscillations. Yeah, you need oscillations and resonances uh, across Couple the whole there. thing. So. 
Thank you so much. Truly invigorating talk and, of course, genuinely exciting. I've never been this excited in a while, so thank you so much. Uh, so, two simple questions. One, have you looked at cerebral organoids? Uh, have you done measurements there? And then another second quick question. Are you, I'm sure you are, are you developing um, sort of more uh, advanced um, sort of systems to measure at an intricate level, cellular level? Um, yeah. I haven't done that. I have plans to do it. <laughs> Need funding, and I'm looking into funding that some Let's people collaborate. have promised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for that question. That's, that's question. a very nice question. Yeah. Uh, totally fascinating work. And I just, could you explain, when you put it near the crabs and the worms, you say the measurements went down? Yeah. And can you explain what you think is happening there? So it's exactly like what happens in a petri dish, I guess. So the, the collapse rate goes below the baseline, okay? Because these, um, you know, invertebrates probably don't have too many collapses going on at, at any given time, you know? So the, uh, at baseline, you have all the humans mostly who have high level of consciousness, and I'm recording like a baseline because of that. And, and these organisms there, they, you know, they, their rate of uh, collapse at baseline is much lower than the, uh, than the baseline of humans. And so that's why I see an inversion. Hmm. Okay. okay, that's exactly how it is uh, probably occurring with the Petri dish also. Okay, so related to the state problem or the state question, like if you imagine someone sitting doing a meditation on presencing versus a non-dual state versus a jhana, do you think you would get different yeah. renditions and if we could start making inferences about consciousness that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Wow, and we, wonderful. Uh, yeah, because yeah, then we, we can are, look at coma patients and get an idea of what's going on with them. Yeah, we're going to look at meditators, uh, good accomplished meditators like Ide, and we're also going to look at some people taking psychedelic drugs. Thanks so much for this. Well, Very exciting. What? One more, please be brief. Very brief. Session. Can you imagine taking it to the Google AI machine and setting it next door to it and see whether it's conscious or not? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I don't think their, their machines are conscious and will not be, but that's a different story. Okay, let's give Santosh a great round of applause. It was really exciting. Way to go. Okay, I, hello Roger, it's a, my great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, who will be talking about why the symmetries of microtubules in a relativity theory may have unexpected implications for the timing of conscious actions. Let's give a round of applause to Sir Roger Penrose. I hope you can hear me, can you? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, can you see the screen? We can see the slide, and we can see you in the corner. So everything's perfect. Oh, I'm in the corner. OK. <laughs> yes. I'm afraid I don't have anything nearly as interesting as what we've just heard. But I'll just tell you a few things which I've been thinking about, um, not necessarily recently, either. Uh, let me move on to the, well, first of all, the question of symmetry, and Stuart told me that since this session has to do with symmetry um, and dimensionality, and I couldn't think of anything I could say which did to do with that, but he told me it was my fault that he's named this uh, after these concepts. So I had to think hard about how symmetry could be relevant to things that I might talk about. And there is one thing in particular with regard to microtubules, which maybe has some interest. So let me, here we have a microtubule. I should say I should apologize for the top right-hand corner because I gather, Stuart, this is an old slide and the idea that it had to do with confirmations seems to be outdated now, but never mind about that. This is a, a picture of a microtubule, which I must have drawn a long time ago. And you can see something about the uh, lattice structure along the microtubule. Now, uh, I, I should explain first that the general idea I had about consciousness was a long, long time ago, and I was impressed by learning about Gödel's theorem, and that there were 
things that seem to be non-computable that under understanding the quality of understanding seemed to be something that you couldn't define in terms of algorithms and if that was the case then there has to be something since our brains are physical objects there has to be something going on in our brains which is part of the physics which might be outside computability and the only thing which i could think of which could possibly be a role play a role of this nature that be un uncomputability uncomputable was the collapse of the wave function because all the other features of physics seem to be something where you could put them on a computer of course make their current physics depends on the continuum the continuous variables and so your calculations are always approximations there is a possible loophole there but i didn't think that was like to be the answer to this this puzzle that I was having to find something in physics that could be non-computable. And I thought about general relativity and electromagnetism and all these things. And it didn't seem there was much hope because you could put those on a computer. Um, what about quantum mechanics? Well, you can put the wave function on it. I, I had the view that it was the collapse of the wave function, which somehow had to be outside what you could compute. Now, current understanding is that it's a random process. Um, it would have to be something a little more subtle than that if it's going to be uh, something which is involved in consciousness. Never mind, let's we'll come to that question later, perhaps. But anyway, I wrote this book, The Emperor's New Mind, where I tried to express this idea that maybe the collapse of the wave function, well, in order for it to be any, play any role, you had to have quantum mechanic, <clears throat> quantum systems going on in my brain, which could um, be sort of big enough in a sense that the uh, uh, you could preserve coherence to a, to a significant level. <coughs> and I, <clears throat> I learned about the Hodgkin-Huxley nerve transmission and I thought there wasn't a hope because the, the uh, <coughs> signals down neurons would disturb the uh, ambient um, material in, in a sort of a random way. And there's no way you could pr preserve coherence just with nerve transmission. So I sort of petered off at the end of my book without having an idea. <coughs> but then Stuart read my book and told me about microtubules. And the microtubules then were the main difference between the first book here on the left and the second one where I realized there might be something in um, microtubule behavior, but I didn't have much idea about it. Okay, well, let me come back to the microtubule. The only thing I wanted to say now, which I hadn't expressed before, has something to do with the structure of microtubules. And uh, you can think of the microtubule lattice as being something like a hexagonal lattice which has uh, three different directions in which it repeats itself. And, uh, but then you roll it up into a cylinder. Now, if you think of it locally, then there are these three different directions. One is uh, when it is rolled up into a cylinder, one is sort of corkscrews around one way, another one corkscrews the, um, the other way, and the other one translates along the length of the microtubule. Now, it always struck me as rather strange that the microtubules you found here have this particular symmetry which goes along the, the microtubule itself. And it's certainly it's possible, in, I, I gather, in, in a dish or something, you can construct all sorts of microtubules which have different numbers of columns. You see, the microtubule has 13 of them. If you change that number to 14 or to 12, you can certainly have microtubules, but then they lose this translational symmetry. They're all twisty, you know, one, one way or the other, um, but they're twisty symmetries. Why does the microtubule that seem to have this, purely, it seems purely accidental, this uh, translational symmetry along the direction of the microtubule? And this reminded me of something I'd seen in some discussion of um, uh, um, um, carbon nanotubes, 
and you can have them with different all sorts of different symmetries. And it seemed to be the case that those which had the symmetry, translational symmetry in the direction of the tubes, they would exhibit superconductivity. And superconductivity at room temperature is something which, well, you can maybe they, they can do it with these nanotubes. But I, I, I'm not sure I can even remember which this article I was looking at. Maybe somebody could find it out for me. But in the uh, study of these carbon nanotubes, <laughs> it seemed to me that when you had this linear symmetry, not just the twisty symmetries, uh, the corkscrew symmetries, but at least one symmetry, which is translational. And then this was something present in these particular carbon nanotubes, which happen to ha exhibit superconductivity. So it's suggested to me that there might be some kind of role which is played by microtubules. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, where, there, where, where it would make use of the this addition of symmetry. And I can't say really much more about this because I never thought about very much more. It just seemed to me that there is it should, something which should be explored. Um, maybe there is something particular about the microtubules which you find, and they have this translational symmetry, um, which could perhaps uh, accompany some, um, sim some quantum effects which could be um, uh, more global than the ones we normally find. Now, I don't want to say too much more about that, um, because uh, really what I want to talk about is something different. Uh, first of all, let me talk about the uh, quantum uh, evolution of the quantum state. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, there are uh, two procedures. One is this Schrodinger equation. You see, people often, when they talk about quantum mechanics, they just talk about the Schrodinger equation. But they sort of they collapse of the wave function or something which is sort of rather embarrassing to quantum mechanics because it's not really part of quantum mechanics to have a theory of that. It's just that when it t changes the quantum amplitudes into, into probabilities and how you go from one to the other is not really explained in current quantum mechanics, in, certainly in, in conventional quantum mechanics. And what just has these two procedures, the Schrodinger equation and the collapse of the wave function. Now the Schrodinger equation tells is a, uh, a smooth, um, computable, if you like, and uh, deterministic process. Uh, it's like Newtonian mechanics in that respect. But it's just the ordinary kind of thing. You just follow the Schrodinger equation and it gives you this um, smooth evolution, which is deterministic. Collapse of the wave function as we understand it, is random. Uh, it's a completely different kind of process. And why do we go from one to the other? Why do we, how do you have a theory which encompasses both of them at the same time? There's a little thing which may be a point which I, th I thought about recently. When people talk about, um, I think it was I'd heard about a lecture which we had been giving, given concerning <coughs> free will in animals. And the question is, how could you tell whether the animals had free will or not? I mean, how do you know? And then I began thinking about, how. what do I say about free will? I mean, is the collapse of the wave function, I know Stuart often says, it gives you scope for free will. But free will, what does it really mean? And people often talk about it. Well, you can be, in fact, there were some of these Libet experiments, I believe, when treat, people tried to be as, as random as they could. And the question was whether they were really being random or not. And... Uh, the free will seemed to be the quality that you could be as random as you like. Now that really can't be the answer. Um, it seemed to me that it isn't really the answer. Because if you want to ask if something has free will, um, well, that means they're using their conscious experiences or conscious understanding or something to do what they want to do. Now what, doing what they want to do depends upon probably some kind of process which they go through, which um, tells them that this is the right thing to do. Now, I'm trying to say that conscious activity is something 
which goes beyond computability. Now you see, it, the freedom that you have in, in, in consciousness, or the freedom of free will, it's not the freedom to be random, uh, that's not the point. It's the freedom to do what you think is the right thing to do. It may be the wrong thing to do, but what you think is the right thing to do. And that depends on your conscious understanding. So I'm trying to say that, again, it's, it's not, it has to be something which is not random. It has to be something which is controlled by some kind of thing which is deeper than random. It's non-computable, some kind of process which is involved in the collapse of the wave function is the idea. Okay, well, let me, let's move away from that. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I think I'm going the wrong way in my pictures. Just a second. Okay, now quantum superposition, let me t talk about that first. You see, it's the quantum superposition is what these quantum processes involve lots of quantum superpositions, and they get uh, you can have a system which involves an environment, and then the environment uh, gets too complicated, and then you want to know what it's doing. Well, the idea is it would still, if you don't have the collapse of the wave function, it would it follow the process of quantum superposition. Now, what <laughs> quantum superposition is that if you have a state A or a state B, both of which are allowable states, then so also is a state alpha A plus beta B. Now, alpha and beta are complex numbers. So they involve the square root of minus one, and it, I always found this very remarkable because I learned about complex numbers when I was doing my uh, undergraduate course, University College in London, and uh, I didn't know anything about quantum mechanics at the time, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if physics somehow used these wonderful numbers and the wonderful mathematics that they derive? And it wasn't until I learned about quantum mechanics that I realized that they actually do play this fundamental role. Now, the thing is that if you're thinking of A as being some object in one location and B as being the location in another object, then it's a bit hard to imagine how you can alpha have a combination of alpha being in one place and beta being the other place. I remember Dirac in his lectures, which I went to uh, when I was a graduate student, and uh, he tried to explain about the superposition and he had said that you have an atom in one place or it could be in another place. And then there were various states where it could be both at once. And then he gave some explanation of why you didn't normally find big things like pieces of chalk in two places at once. And I remember being uh, distracted by something that was going outside the window, and I never heard his explanation, which is probably a good thing, because it, his explanation was probably something to calm me down and not worry. But um, <laughs> it seems that uh, it is something that I felt I needed to worry about. And I didn't hear his explanation, which is probably a good thing. Anyway, uh, let me explain that it's, quantum superposition is very fundamental to quantum mechanics. And it's not something which just says that if something can be over here or over there, then you have these funny looking states where it could be both places at once. It really is a central part of, well, I thought I, one of the things that's very nice to do is think about spin. And the spin of a spin half particle can be described as the state, the general state of a spin half particle can be described as take some direction in space and then it's right handed about that direction. Now, the thing is that there are really two different states or two different independent states of a spin half particle and they can be spinning right handed about the upward direction or about the downward direction. And then all these different complex combinations of the two are represented by these linear combinations, and they are with these complex numbers. And you see this relationship between these wonderful complex numbers and the structure of space. And I found this extremely striking and remarkable. And there is nothing special about up or down. And all the other combinations are on equal footing with them up or down. So if you have a state like this, then you can see that there's nothing special about one or the other. All the different combinations are just as good as the individual ones. So that's a nice example showing you that. Now, 
uh, much later, when I started worrying about how to bring quantum mechanics and relativity, general relativity theory together in some sort of way, I realized that you needed to have uh, something like a collapse of the wave function. You see, there are the two basic principles. Quantum mechanics is this superposition principle, which I've just been talking about. And general relativity, it's the principle of um, super, principle of equivalence, which is saying that locally, a gravitational field can be eliminated by free fall. And one can show that, <coughs> that these two basic principles are, are essentially incompatible with each other. That if you try to have them both at once, you're led to a limit in the time scale of the superposition. So that this was what drove me to a particular uh, lifetime for a superposition, which is given by this formula here. Uh, I learned later that two years earlier, Deoshi had come to the same conclusion using some different arguments. Anyway, that gave perhaps the fact that there was another way of doing it was an was additional reason for perhaps taking it seriously. But the argument is that if you have a what you have a, a quantity called EG, which I'm calling the, uh, well, that's the energy, the, if you take of a superposition, it's the gravitational self energy of the difference between the two states. And if it's a spin half particle, then there, there isn't such a, I mean, the thing could go on forever because it's, uh, there's no such energy difference here. But if you take a, a say a piece of chalk in two places at once, then there is this energy difference. You take the um, energy, the en the self energy. Well, it's better to explain it another way, which is at the bottom of the slide. I don't quite know why it's got slid down at the bottom. At the bottom of the slide, um, we have. You can describe it in another way. You could say that the two bodies. You can so you can think of a body. In a superposition of two locations, what is the EG? Well, you think of that body, um, two instances of that body on top of each other. Then you try to move them apart to the place where they're in superposition and ask how much energy would that cost you to move them apart when you consider only gravity. You have to ignore electric, electric forces and nuclear forces, all these which are much, much bigger. You ignore all those other forces. You just take the gravitational force to pull them apart. And how much energy would that be? And this is this quantity EG. So that's the quantity EG now. OK, well now let's try and get back to the symmetry question. Um, you see, if, if you have uh, a, a fundamental thing like this, which is supposed to be consistent with relativity, then it has to be consistent not just with general relativity, it has to be consistent with special relativity. So if, you, if you're considering your moving frames and things, the, the theory has to work with different frames. So I have here a space-time picture. I'm imagining a body right at the bottom of the picture. It's put into a superposition of two locations. As you move up the picture, they get further and further apart. At a certain point, they collapse to one. So it goes to the location Q or the location Q star. Let's say it goes to Q star. Now, I want to describe this picture in different space, different frames. You see, I'm using now the symmetry of special relativity. Special relativity has a symmetry, so I wanted to bring symmetry into the argument, and so that was the point I was doing this here. Uh, I was explaining uh, the fact that you have the symmetry of special relativity is a little bit of a problem when you consider this, this Yoshi uh, uh, scheme. You see, um, how do we suppose this? I imagine the body is at the bottom. It superposed into two locations, and then eventually it goes to point Q star rather than Q in this case. Let's go to say it goes to Q star. Now, if I describe this picture according to ordinary, let's say, ordinary description, you'd think of your horizontal slices through the picture. Uh, giving you what happens, and it goes on, chugs away, and then at a particular moment, it, it, the superposition becomes Q star rather than Q, and then it, then Q has disappeared, and it becomes Q. But how you suppose we describe this picture according to some 
observer, let's not look at all as an observer because nobody really is looking at it, but some frame of reference which is moving rapidly over to the left or to the right. It has to be with less than the speed of light, but let's say it's the, uh, if it's moving to the left as you go up, those are the T ones where the, uh, sorry, it's the other ones, these are the S ones, where the, what is regarded as simultaneous with regard to that frame of reference, it would be the, that the slope up for the ones you see S, S, S0 and S1, those are two uh, descriptions which would be regarded as simultaneous to the uh, observer moving up to the left. And that one, you see the Q star would have become the whole state before the Q has actually disappeared. You see, there's still uh, an amplitude for Q to be there when the whole state has become Q star. And that doesn't make any sense, because that means there's still a probability that it might be Q, and then it could be both places at once, and that makes nonsense. It's it, even worse for the other state, I suppose, because that's moving off to the right, and then the slope is the other way around. These are the T's, and T0 and T's S, there's no problem there. But when you get to T1, you see that one of them has already disappeared, and the other one hasn't quite made it up its mind yet whether it's disappear or not. And that doesn't make any sense because it might disappear still. And that isn't, doesn't make any sense. So you, the picture doesn't work. The picture doesn't work for the collapse of the wave function unless you go right down to the point O. That is to say, it's the reality of the state was all the time the left-hand one. But what do you say about the superposition? Well, to make sense of this, you really have to have two different notions of reality. And I'm calling these two notions classical reality and quantum reality. The quantum reality, it's true that there is this superposition. And this is the less robust kind of reality. And it's a little bit hard to pin it down. The classical reality is the one which goes off to the right. And that is, uh, you have to make a distinction between the two kinds of reality in order to make sense of this idea. Now, um, I'm not sure I've got the right yet. Here, here it moves. Quantum reality. Now, quantum reality is really defined by a notion introduced by Einstein, what I'm calling Einstein's dictum. He says, if in any, well, I'm, I got my eyesight is too bad to read it. Actually, perhaps you can read it. The concept is that if you can perform an experiment on a system, and that system is not changed by the experiment, so it leaves it alone, and it gives you an answer with certainty, then that gives you a reality to that state. So this kind of reality is what I'm calling quantum reality. Einstein didn't distinguish it from any other kind of reality, I think, but it is, it is what I mean by quantum reality. And that's, I got 1935, I think, is when he, the state that came from him. This is a quote from Einstein. So uh, quantum reality is defined by the Einstein criterion. And this is the kind of reality you have here. So if you imagine a, a state of spin, which might happen to be sort of as indicated up and to the right, then you can perform a measurement on that state of spin. And if your measurement is to say, is your spin in that particular direction? It will say, yep, with certainty, yes, that is my direction. But if you try some other direction, then it's, or if you could say, you see, you can't ask the state of spin, hello state, which way are you spinning? It, it just looks blankly at you and says, I don't answer questions like that. Choose the direction and then I'll tell you an answer. Now, if you happen to choose the right direction, then it will say, yes, with certainty, you got it right. If you choose some other direction, it will just give you probabilistic answers, uh, depending upon how far off you are. If you're nearly right, it'll say, usually it'll give you the right, it'll say yes, occasionally say no, if you got it at right angles so that direction, it'll say 50% right, 50% no. If it's, you've got the opposite direction, it will say no every single time. So this is the way you have to understand quantum reality. You can't, under, you can't ask the state what its, real, what its reality is. You can confirm what it is. So it's a question of confirming rather than ascertaining. Classical reality is something you can ascertain. Quantum reality is something which you could confirm. If you get it right, if you've got it wrong, it will just give you probabilistic answers. 
And it's important to make this distinction. Uh, otherwise, it, uh, you, it doesn't seem to make sense of the way the world works. So classical reality, I have now a picture of the sort of thing I mean. At the bottom, it is a space-time picture, roughly speaking. So time is sort of going up the picture, sort of sloping off to the right, if you like, going up the picture. At the bottom, we have a laser which is aiming a high energy photon at a beam splitter or a half silvered mirror, if you like, and it splits the photon into going horizontally and going down. And so that means that the horizontal state, uh, it hits this little lump of material, a speck of dust or something, a little a tiny grain there. It hits it, and this thing then starts to move by the impact of the photon. If it didn't hit it, it's left in the same place. Now you follow the evolution of this thing as you go up, it starts to be in a superposition of two locations. It keeps on as you go up into two locations, and then the collapse happens, one of them disappears, and it becomes the other. Now the quantum reality sort of tries to follow both branches at once in some way. The classical reality follows the left-hand branch because that's what the answer happens to be. But there is something kind of curiously retroactive about this. It seeks to go backwards in time to dis establish what the reality is, which is a kind of strange idea. But it, you, it seems to be what you need in order to make sense of things like this. This is a sort of um, einstein podolsky rosen type of experiment, where, again, it's a space-time picture. The picture is going up from bottom to top. Right at the bottom, well, the, the left-hand one is called Alice, and the right one is called Bob. For some reason, they always call Alice and Bob. A and B, they are. And the, they are given a spin zero state, which that means it, when it's split into two halves, Alice takes the one half and Bob takes the other half. So it could, it could be, say, two electrons or something like that. One, one <coughs> spins in some way, which is opposite to the other one. However, it's not very determined which way it spins. The state, the quantum state, is that it's the superposition of Alice being spin one way and Bob the opposite, and Alice the opposite and Bob the one, or if you like that, but it's a completely symmetrical state. Uh, and you can follow the evolution of this as it goes up, and then at a certain point, Alice makes her measurement. She chooses something, if you can see that at the right top left part of the picture, uh, she measures, tries to measure it, uh, sort of angled up, upwards and to the right a little bit. And the state says, no, that's wrong. And so Alice's state comes to the conclusion it must be the opposite. And then Bob's state instantaneously, well, it's worse than instantaneously, because you have to look at the thing to make it realistic, uh, to make it um, consistent with special relativity. And the only way you can do that is that Alice's state, the quantum reality of her state, propagates backwards along the past curve. So you can see these sloping lines through this point where Alice makes her measurement and goes back and hits Bob's state. So Bob's state becomes spinning the opposite way to Alice's. And that is the quantum reality of the state. Now, if Bob could ascertain what that state was, it would be in real trouble, because that means you could send signals faster than light and space and special relativity would be out the window. There would be no way of uh, making sense of special relativity. Special relativity only makes sense because you can't send signals faster than light. So Bob, since it's quantum reality, Bob state, Bob state but at the point QB, I think you can see it, you follow the diagonal line off to the right hand from the measurement that Alice had made, and it retroactively changes Bob's state to be the opposite of Alice's measurement. She said it, it measures, well, it's the same as Alice's measurement because it's the opposite of what she finds, put it like that. Um, so it's now become the quantum reality of Bob's state. Same way that Bob makes a, a measurement even later than Alice, and along his past light cone, it has influenced Alice's state. You could say that the quantum reality of her state was already fixed by the time she measured it. Now, it's a pretty crazy picture, but it seems to be completely consistent. This tells you the quantum reality of the whole situation, which completely consistent, looks crazy, 
because it involves these retrocausal effects. So you have to say that these retrocausal effects are really there, that they're only in quantum reality, so you can't really ever sort of make use of it in, in, a, in, a, in an experiment. However, it may be, now here this is, it goes back to uh, the things which I have talked about before, in fact, this picture comes from my, The Emperor's New Mind. It was already there, and I already worried about these things. It's an experiment due to Benjamin Libet, where he um, had an electrode attached to a patient's finger. The patient was undergoing an op I believe it might be Ill Ill illegal to do these operations now, so it have to be done in a different way. But the patient was uh, having an operation on the brain which uh, meant that the brain was, was revealed. And uh, during this operation, uh, the patient had given uh, the experimenter permission to do an experiment at the same time. So the experiment involved stimulating the finger. And then uh, you can see at the top, the stimulation of the finger is that little vertical line. Um, and the, you can also stimulate a part of the brain which was concerned with uh, uh, um, censoring the, or sensing what has happened to the finger. Now you can measure uh, the the, uh, the 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 brain stimulation. Sorry, uh, I have to remember what my picture is doing. The um, the, <coughs> the finger stimulation is their vertical line, and there is a, a fast-moving clock in the room, and the patient looks at the clock and tries to uh, say whether the finger stimulation took place at a certain moment. And it is pretty well simultaneous, just very slightly, tiny events, almost simultaneous with the um, stimulation of the finger. But then that's looking at the fast moving clock. And you, you all it means that the sensation of the finger is judged as being simultaneously simultaneous with the sensation of where the hand of the clock was. But that is, seems to be almost simultaneous. Now, if you stimulate the brain, that's the second line there. Um, that's the wiggly line. Stimulation of the brain, there is nothing felt by the patient until about, uh, I think it's a, uh, a half a second, a quarter of a second later. I can't remember. No, nothing is felt. Sorry, nothing is felt until half a second later. That's the third line down. So the the... Stimulation of the brain is felt, but about half a second later. Then the, the next line down, that's the fourth line down. If you stimulate the finger first, then this is the curious one, because the brain stimulation, although it was later, seems somehow seems to cancel out the finger stimulation, even though the stimulation seems to be simultaneously with, with what the clock said. So how is it that the... Uh, later stimulation of the brain somehow could wipe out something which seemed to have got, occurred earlier. Well, that's a puzzling thing. And I remember worrying about this, that maybe one's, stimula you know, one's conscious ex experiences could, could be delayed something like by something like half a second or something like that. Uh, but then you have to worry about things like if somebody is playing ping pong or, well, I used to play ping pong when I was at university. And it seemed to me if I was going to decide whether to hit the ball one, or the, one way or the other, that depended on looking at what I thought the page, the, my opponent was doing and whether it would hit that my opponent would be unex, uh, more expecting the thing to go one way or the other than I'd flick it the other way. Now, the current view is that that's all done unconsciously. And I said, no, I was thinking which, which way to, I did that conscious th thinking about. But somehow it seems to be that this conscious impressions go are backwards referred. Now the question is can you make sense of all this in such a way that you if if uh, the collapse of the wave function is what's involved in the um, the choice it, I mean that's the view of what, which we have in Orca or the Orca proposal is that it is, is the collapse of the wave function which is um, involves in making a conscious decision, then th that would have to be something where you, you study how the collapse of the wave function works. And it has this intrinsic retroactive co 
aspect to it. You have to be careful that it doesn't uh, cause causal loops, which, which are inconsistent. But nevertheless, if it's not causing some kind of inconsistency like that, you might explain in some way how effects can be retrocausal in this strange kind of way. I think that uh, Stuart has some certain ideas about this, which struck me as quite plausible. And the idea is if you have an athlete, not just me playing, playing ping pong, I'm not an athlete, but, but if you imagine a, a real professional, then um, deciding whether, say, a tennis player, or deciding whether to hit the ball down the line or cross court, then that decision, uh, all the muscle movements and exactly what to do must clearly be unconscious because in order to hit the ball to the left, the, the player doesn't decide which muscles move in which exact way. All that thing is done unconsciously, sure. But the actual decision as to whether to make one choice or another, that could, that could be a conscious decision, which is somehow retrocausally in this way, goes back effectively in time. As long as it doesn't cause a causal problem, that's okay. Now, the argument that I was making before about um, free will, see, free will, I often wondered about, you know, does it mean anything to say you have free will or something? Now, free will, I remember used to play my younger brother at this paper, stone, and scissors kind of thing. And I got very alarmed because he used to be able to beat me almost consistently. And I thought, well, look, I'm trying to be as random as I can. How can he beat me consistently? So what I did is I went into my father's study and I took out a bo um, volume of logarithms and I took, opened it in the middle of the page uh, and then I made a sort of random from, from these logarithms taking them as basically random numbers. I could code, which I wish I did, scissors, stone, or paper, and I just made a long strip of paper, and I followed this, which seemed to be pretty well random. And then I broke even. My brother couldn't beat me if I was doing something which was effectively random. Of course, it's not random, it's just logarithm, logarithm thing, tables, but it was effectively random. Um, but the thing was that he could recognize patterns in what I was doing, and I was trying to be as random as I could. So the, the argument I'm trying to make here is that it's not consciousness, if it's doing something which is um, um, based on, on the collapse of the wave function, it has to be something which is not random, it's something beyond random in some sense. It's something which may involve quantum realities which are not random, and it's way, way beyond anything we can think of now, and certainly, when you think of making a conscious decision, the whole point of it is that you go back to decide whether it's a good idea or not to make that decision, unless you're trying to be random, of course. <laughs> but if it's something which might be beneficial to do A rather than B, then you have reason to believe this. And it comes from your conscious understanding of whether it's a good thing to do or not. So that's the kind of argument I'm trying to say. Conscious understanding is something which involves the collapse of the wave function in some theory which we don't have yet. I regard this as one of the big challenges of physics to find a theory, and it's clearly going to be a sort of very strange kind of theory, which involves the kind of retrocausality. But nevertheless, a theory which somehow involves gravity at the same sense times quantum mechanics. It's not quantum gravity because quantum gravity means applying quantum mechanics to gravity. It's gravitizing quantum mechanics. And so far, I think nobody has got very far with that at all. And I'll have to leave you with that quandary. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Roger. Let me first say that I made a mistake on the timing of the schedule, which uh, we're not actually behind according to how it should be. We are the way I wrote it down. So I apologize to everybody for that. So uh, let's start over here, please. Good morning, sir, Roger. My name is William Cox, and I have a substantial question to ask you, but it requires just a bit of background. So if you could bear with me just for a minute. Uh, in 2015, I published a, a little paper on a book on philosophy called The Book of Mankind. And in it, I postulated that we have evolved to being a mind kind on Earth and as a part of a universal mind kind. 
Now, in the nine years uh, since then, I, I included in that book a, uh, a chapter on mind in which I followed pretty much the classical view, but I put a paragraph in there based on your, uh, your theory, and in the nine years since then, <clears throat> with additional work and reading, and particularly in the last couple of years since I was invited to be a part of this conference, I've become convinced that you are right, and that not only are you right, but you and Roger Penrose, uh, you and uh, uh, Stuart, probably you should have a, another Nobel Prize for this work. Now, in that same nine years, I had another small chapter in that book that dealt with the universe. And in that, I also followed the classical view of a, an expanding universe based from a Big Bang with dark matter holding galaxies together, dark energy separating them. But in these nine years, <clears throat> I've come to a completely opposite conclusion. And that is that with the new technology that we have, the new platforms of observation are, 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 are going in the opposite direction and they are validating an electromagnetic um, universe as proposed by Hans Alvin, the Nobel laureate in, in 1970 uh, of an electromagnetic universe within a plasma. This includes the X-ray telescope, uh, the Chandra telescope that as it looks out into the universe, it sees a web connecting everything that we observe, but it's connected by electrical filaments. The radio telescope, uh, worldwide observation looking out in the radio spectra. It looks at the galaxies and there it sees the massive jets being emitted from the core of galaxies for, uh, uh, consisting of a gamma, gamma waves. Uh, now, in addition, uh, the most spectacularly we have the Webb telescope that, yes, I'm, I'm getting to it. I, the Webb telescope is looking out and is finding massive galaxies out there. So the collective thing that I'm asking you here, based upon your, your background both in cosmology and in consciousness, is this. If, in fact, that universe that we're looking at, and, the, and this continues to be validated, is, is an infinite, non-expanding universe, and that gives us an infinite number of galaxies, an infinite number of warm suns, an infinite number of Earths like we have, giving rise to organic life such as we are that, that evolves consciousness <clears throat> and ultimately this quantum Okay, mind please, please wrap it up. Uh, you're, so, you can't so give a talk. So my question is, if that is true, isn't there a cosmic consciousness that our, co that our quantum brain entangles with and, 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 and creates a cosmic consciousness that we are a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Well, all I can say is that's not my view. <laughs> and the evidence for gravity being the main thing which is involved in cosmology uh, is pretty strong. I don't think electromagnetism, I'm not sure they're saying that. But anyway, I, I don't really agree with what they're saying. Sorry about that. Well, thank, thank you. Let's go over thank here. Thank you for the opportunity. Please be brief. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Roger, for all the effort you put into this quest for understanding consciousness. Uh, we talked a lot here about the idea that there's a being that correlates with objective reduction. And I'm, my question is, have you con considered the possibility that the, the consciousness is what it feels like to be in superposition rather than it being the end of, at the end of a process of superposition that it is superposition. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand it. It feels like a superposition? Is that what you're saying? And what I what didn't, was that? I, I, it, yeah, it, could consciousness correlate with being in superposition rather than collapse of superposition? Have you given that any thought? Well, Nick, <laughs> I still don't quite understand the question. I think. The, I I think the I question think is, could conscious experience, our subjectivity, correlate with being in superposition rather than collapse? It might, 
collapse of the one function. Might, you might be able to have states which were, I'm not quite sure I understand. I mean, superpositions I mean, are part of, as I mentioned in my spin half situation, you have superpositions and they could be perfectly ordinary states like others. You don't have some states which are superpositions and others which aren't. And you, the problem with the having a, a, a big massive body in two places at once, then that is, seems it doesn't persist. I, I, I don't quite, I'm sorry, I, I think I didn't really understand your question. I mean, I mean <laughs> I've, been, I've been here in a state of superposition. Will I ask a question of Roger today or will I not ask a question of Roger today? And yeah, now well, that's been determined. <laughs> you ha you had it. <laughs> <laughs> and then this happened in go my over consciousness. Here. I, I, I think uh, some people are saying the consciousness is in the superposition, not the collapse. I, I disagree with that, I think. But that we can't really uh, discuss that further. Oh, I see. Uh, well, no, we don't see it. Well, I don't see that explains anything. I mean, we don't see electron, I mean, we don't see massive bodies in superpositions. And so what does that mean, the consciousness in the superposition? It doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you. I mean, there was a view due to Wigner and other people who thought it was the conscious perceiver which would reduce the state. Now, I don't think it works either, but it was quite a common view amongst people in the early days. I think von Neumann had a similar sort of view. But somehow, the superpositions could exist, and only when some conscious being looked at the state, if you like, or perceived the superposition, then it would become one or the other. I don't think that's what you're saying, uh, but if it's what you're saying, I think that view can be refuted um, by, by considering various uh, considerations. I, I won't go into it now. Go ahead. Um, hello, I was just curious. So I understand that- Microphone, I don't, oh, closer. Sorry, thank you. Um, so I understand that an argument for why the collapse must happen is that you can't add state vectors on two different Hilbert spaces and different metrics. Outside, oh, state. sorry. So I understand that there's an argument for why the, that the, the collapse must happen, um, which is that you can't add state vectors on two different Hilbert spaces, and different metrics have different Hilbert spaces. Why are they different Hilbert spaces? You could make a bigger Hilbert space, which has both of them. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm sure. I, I'm afraid I didn't quite um, follow that either. You see. Let me uh, maybe ask this another way. So, I'm curious. Yeah. So, um, two uh, two superimposed uh, different spin states might have some sort of angular momentum. Well, they do have some sort of angular momentum. I'm curious if that could cause some frame drag on space time. Say something like uh, like how the ergosphere um, happens around the black hole. And I'm curious if you think that. Maybe if there's no spatial separation between two different superimposed um, spin states, could you still get some sort of collapse due to that, rather than the spatial? Well, if there's a mass displacement involved, yes. I mean, certainly, that, that's the thing. If you move the two things apart too far, then the, um, the according to the scheme I'm proposing, or the Gioshi time scale, if you like, that thing will collapse to one or the other. And if anything even as big as a speck of dust, it would be almost instantaneous. So, uh, the, the, you see, you only get these two positions persisting for very, very tiny systems. And then people try to argue, well, they somehow they, you want to make the rules of quantum mechanics nice and linear and all that stuff. And so those two positions would have to persist to very large objects. But they clearly don't. And not in, not in our observed universe. So there is the, if you like, the Wigner view, which is to say, well, um, it's the conscious observer who has to make the state go to one or the other. Uh, actually, I, t I talked to Wigner about it once, and he did, he wasn't as dogmatic about that point of view as one tends to think. But, uh, um, I, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to cut it off there. I apologize, part of this, uh, because I, I put the, uh, the times down wrong. Roger, I'd like to take my prerogative to ask you one question. Is the, the translational symmetry in the microtubule uh, because of the Fibonacci, uh, d d uh, d does that account for the, uh, um, the, the fact that the 13 is optimal? No, you see, it, it depends on the nature of tubulin. You see, if you took some different substance, 
then, well, it, it, it's the combination of tubulin and the, the geometry. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> if you took some different, I don't see any specific connection with the Fibonacci numbers. You see, you do, you do have clearly the, the 5, 8, and the 13. You see, it's 5 one way and 8 the other way and 13 together. Maybe there is something else which is playing that role. It doesn't talk about the... Um, I mean, I did say if you change the 13 to a 14, then you lose the symmetry along the direction. But you could also change the nature of the tubulin, you see, oh. and make it so there was a symmetry again. I see. So I don't quite see it. There's something deeper. I, and I think I'm quite prepared to believe that there is something in that 5, 8, and 13 and the Fibonacci numbers, which is important in what's going on here. But it's not really that closely connected with having the one direction along the fiber, one along the, the microtubule, which is uh, a symmetry also, because you could change the nature of the tubulins. You, you monkey with the tubulin and make it a bit different, and then that one might twist a little bit. So it's not just the fives and the... Okay. I mean, the five and the eight and the 13 may well be significant, but it's not explained, as far as I can see, in what I was saying. I mean, if you have a superconductivity of some sort, something like superconductivity, along the direction of the microtubule, that's the kind of thing I'm suggesting. There might be, have to be some other story connected with the Fibonacci numbers, because it's not specifically Fibonacci. Okay, thank you very much. Let's give uh, Sir Roger a great round of applause.